All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 5 and then verse 5. Last time I read that passage to you, so let me expound it a little more. And one of the elders, okay, so one of the 24 elders, remember that's representing the whole church definitely and possibly, possibly the Jews before, saith unto me, he says to John, weep not. So John's weeping because no one can open the book with seven seals. But notice who can open it. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he is interest, introducing Jesus Christ. The root of David hath prevailed. There is no doubt this is referring to Jesus Christ. The reason why is when you look at the book of Genesis, Jacob talks about from Judah will come a lion's whelp and he will come down and conquer his enemies. And as you read the genealogy from Matthew chapter 1, which introduces Jesus' genealogy, Judah is mentioned. And then you'll notice David is also mentioned in that line. That's why the verse says the root of David. So there is no doubt this is talking about Jesus Christ. Notice, hath prevailed to open the book. So I explained to you last time that there had to be a conquering of Jesus Christ. His first coming and his second coming are absolutely essential for this verse, verse 5, to work. Because if he did not die on the cross, then he would not be able to open the seals, unleash the tribulation, and set up his kingdom, and we all live happily ever after. Now, you notice the way I was talking while using these fingers, right? So it was pointing out his first coming while I was explaining, and then his second coming. See, those were two essential aspects. You'll notice that he's able to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, this part I mentioned to you that the book with seven seals, I believe, is referring to the book of Revelation. I already explained why. We looked at Daniel chapter 12. We looked at Revelation chapter 22. And then I mentioned about Revelation chapter 1, that it's talking about the book of the prophet, uh, to unseal the book of the prophecy. And then... It was referring to the book of Revelation in those three passages. But then what's really interesting is this, is that if we're going to say that this is the book of Revelation, so it's, it has seven seals right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I always have to do that. Okay, so while it has these seven seals, what's very interesting is this, is that if we're going to say that it is the book of Revelation, then let's take it this way. If you go back to the verse where it says, at verse, let's see right here, verse 1, this book, if it's Revelation, notice it's written within, right? But it's also written where? On the back side, right? So it's on the back side right here. So let's pretend, I know this is the front, but let's pretend this is the back, okay? Now, written within and, writ uh, and written on the back side as well. There's writing in this book of Revelation. Why is that necessary? I'm going to show you something here. So then if we're going to divide it like this with the seals, then it can go like this. It can be Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, first seal. And then it can go Revelation chapter 2, 3, and 4. Uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> not two, <laughs> four, five, six. Four, five, six, and then you see the second seal. And then you go to the third seal, seven, eight, nine, and then there's your third seal. Let's keep the count going, all right? And then you go 10, 11, 12, number four. And then you go to 13, 14, 15. Let's see if this works. That's the fifth seal. And then you go to the sixth one, 16, 17, 18, number six. And then your seventh seal, 19, 20, 21. Oh, it doesn't seem to work because Revelation has 22 chapters, not 21. But remember, it's written within and what? The back side. There's your chapter 22. Why is that? Perhaps because it's appropriate and it's appropriate where God puts it on the backside of this book 
warning do not tamper with this book because Revelation chapter 22 says do not add to it do not subtract from it now before you all think that I'm a genius and Dr. Gene Kim for coming up with this it was brother Robert who mentioned that idea so all right yeah before I get prideful I was going to claim it as my own yeah but I'm I have to give it to brother Robert right there yeah <laughs> so but uh, Brother Robert, he was just bringing it up as an idea. He said, why is it written on the backside, preacher? I was like, I don't know. And then he said, uh, maybe because God's saying, do not tamper with this book. And I was like, oh, that's a really good one right there. So maybe that's the reason why. But here's the thing. The point is, is that it's written on the backside and written within. And this fits right here. It fits right here then with the seven seals. So that's what's really interesting. Okay, now let's look at verse 6. And I beheld, so John's looking up, and lo, in the midst of the throne. So, lo, it's so archaic English that people don't understand what that word means. Lo and behold, y'all don't say that phrase? Yeah. And lo and behold, here it shows up. Yeah. Now, unfortunately for Judas White, who thinks that he's all a scholar, he thinks that's a very hard word for you people to understand right here. Okay. And lo, in the what? Midst of the throne and of the four beasts and the midst of the elders. Ah, remember that picture? I drew it out before last time in Revelation. Remember there was a throne and then four cherubim surrounding it? And then surrounding that, 24 elders, right? Okay, if you picture that, I'm not going to draw it for you right now. Okay, give me a break. So, in the midst of that, what? Stood a lamb as it had been slain. So, there's a lamb who was slain, killed having seven horns and seven eyes. So we know who the lamb that was slain is. That has to be Jesus Christ. If you look at John chapter 1, what did John the Baptist say? Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So we see right here that there is a lamb over here. And this lamb, he is slain. Huh. So it's as if it had been slain. Now, one of the questions is this, is that if this is Jesus Christ right now, we're like wondering if this is referring to him as a lamb right now, physically, literally as a lamb right now, or is it just a title that's given to him? Well, the thing is this, is that John says that he saw a lamb as it had been slain at verse 6. So, which is very interesting concerning God. What you got to understand concerning God is that when he reveals himself, he does not have to only uh, manifest himself as one way. Remember, the Holy Spirit, how did it manifest itself? You can't see it because John chapter 3, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is like wind. You can't see it. You just have to feel it. But the Holy Spirit manifested itself as a dove coming down. How did God speak to people on earth? As the angel of the Lord. Satan can do that too where he transforms into an angel of light. See that? So notice right here that if we're going to see this as a literal passage, it may be that God, Jesus Christ, was manifesting himself right here. And then all of a sudden, he switched back to his earthly form at verse 7. Because you'll notice that he took the book out of his hand at verse 7. So he may have manifested itself as a lamb that had been slain as like an introduction. And then he... Uh, transform, manifest himself as a human and took that book out of God's hand. So this is supposedly, if this is not a literal case at verse 6, then uh, it's a more of a metaphorical name. It may be. It may be just representing Jesus Christ as human form. God manifests in the flesh, introducing himself, taking the book. So either or, either or, but it just seems like that at verse 6, John is seeing literally seeing this lamb as it had been slain. And he mentioned seven horns, seven eyes. So why would all that come from, right? Unless he didn't see that. So we see right here that he's got seven eyes right here. Why would God have seven eyes? Because the reason why is seven is his favorite number. And then he has seven horns as well. Now you'll notice that in your Bible, there is a being who also has seven heads and tries to imitate Jesus Christ. And that is the dragon when we come to the book of Revelation. Satan has his church, Babylon, that sits on seven hills. You'll notice that Satan always imitates Jesus Christ. He wants to be like Jesus Christ. But notice the seven horns and seven eyes, what it's supposed to be. He has seven horns, seven eyes, which are the what? 
seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So these are all referring to the seven spirits. But notice right here, these seven spirits were what? Sent forth into all the earth, right? So here we are on earth. What is that referring to? Why did you read our previous passages? Revelation what? Two and three. So Revelation two and three, what's interesting then is this, when Jesus Christ sent down his Holy Spirit at the beginning of the church, right? These seven spirits started operating ever since Acts chapter 2. And remember, if we take it as Revelation 2 and 3, as the seven different church ages right here, the whole church age with seven churches, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then this would make perfect sense where the Holy Spirit was manifesting itself. This is why I am not a hyper-dispensationalist. So it's, if you apply this to the Christian church, then this is going to make a lot more sense. So Ephesus, Smyrna, do some of you remember the other churches? There was Pergamos, and then there was Thyatira, and then there was Sardis, mm -hmm. and then uh, do you know the next one? Yeah, good old Philly, right? Philadelphia. That was the golden age, right? So Philadelphia. And y'all don't know the last one, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah, we have a Laodicean right there screaming it out, you know. <laughs> Laodicea, you know? Yeah, we all know that one. Why? Because we hate that age the most. We're living in it. <laughs> but you see right here that now the Holy Spirit, he comes down in all the seven stages of the church age. And remember, we proved that the seven spirits was referring to Jesus Christ, and that's that verse that we just read. So, it makes perfect sense why there are some verses in your Bible that talks about the Holy Spirit inside us, but it's Jesus inside us. Why? What does that mean? What that means is Revelation chapter 5. See, from Jesus Christ came out these seven spirits. See, the Holy Spirit, and then he manifests himself all over right here. But you'll notice it says upon the earth, right? And then all of a sudden, we read chapter 4, where are these seven spirits? Well, if you look at chapter 5, verse 6, they're now up in heaven, right? Okay, so what does that mean? I know you don't want to say it, all right? Now, I keep saying this over and over again, but these people just don't want to say it. All of a sudden, they're down here, and now they're up here. All of a sudden, at the end, right? It's coincidentally, at the end of this church age right here, it just happens to be up here. What does that mean? It means before the tribulation, there's a rapture. So this makes a lot more sense if you put a pre-trib rapture view in the entire book of Revelation with the dispensational mindset, everything clicks. It makes sense. If you also put double application where it's talking about the Christian church and tribulation doctrine, everything's going to fit. It's going to fit a lot more. 